Okay. Hi, everybody. I see you all. Everybody's uh, filtering in. Um, see you there, John. Good to see you, Mr. Madison. <laughs> hey there, Melissa. We're gonna we're gonna start in a couple of minutes. Uh, very happy to have Wendy Wendy Ray doing this presentation. And Wendy, I'm gonna mute for most of the time because I'm in Charlottesville and it's very surprisingly noisy being in a even a small city. So <laughs> yeah. Fire trucks and motorcycles and all kinds of things. It is. <laughs> That's why I try to stay outside of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um Hi, everybody. Well, we are at the top of the hour, and it's so wonderful to see so many people uh, join in today. Um, uh, we're um, uh, right now, uh, I think most most of the crew is uh, is out in the field, and uh, Wendy would normally be in the field today, but she is doing the lunch and learn, and she was uh, very excited about uh, being able to talk about some of her research on the Gilmore Cabin. Um, the Gilmore family, especially. Um, but um, uh, so for the lunch and learn today, Wendy uh, Ray is a one of the, is part of the archaeology team here at Montpelier, and Wendy started um, volunteering with us back in September of last year. She had done the field school at Monticello and heard about uh, the work we have been doing, especially our relationship with the MDC Montpelier Descendant Committee. And um, wanted to 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 get some experience in the field, but then also wanted to take on a project to to um, to be able to write a um, a, a paper for her app application to graduate school, which she's in now at the uh, University of Leicester, uh, getting her master's in in art in archaeology, and uh, we have a, a history with Leicester, especially with Chris. He uh, Chris finished his master's at Leicester, and we've had a number of people that have gone through uh, Leicester. Um, but the project that um, Wendy worked on was looking at uh, a, a, um, a, a context at the Gilmore cabin and inside the building on the second floor, an interior hearth that uh, was a sealed context that we knew some about, but we didn't e hadn't even begun to tap the resources. And what really um, uh, made this almost a you know a match made from the stars is that um wendy's background is is not just anthropology but she has a, a fashion background she does she's done a lot a lot of sewing she knows fabrics and where this came into the work at the gilmore cabin is that um in those deposits what wendy started seeing were all these small scraps of fabric that had survived because it was an interior deposit inside you know in, in sealed within a uh, within a hearth and so she was she has extensive experience in in uh in fabrics through her background in fashion design she attended the premier um uh fashion institute uh for the west coast fashion institute for technology in california um among many other things that wendy's done so um but but without further further uh you know uh 
I do want to uh, introduce Wendy here. So Wendy's going to present on her finds on the Gilmore Farm. And today, Wendy is um, working as part of the staff here at Montpelier. Um, she's uh, doing this while uh, you know going to school full time at the University of Leicester and hopefully going to do even more projects with her as, as projects, you know, their thesis um, at Leicester. So, Wendy, was there anything I missed with your introduction? No, oh, that was fantastic. That was fantastic. I appreciate it. Great. Well, excited to hear about what your finds were with the uh, the Gilmore Farm. And Wendy also does um, uh, quite a bit of genealogy, too, and she's brought in uh, those talents. She's been working with... Um, with uh, uh, Becca Davis, who is the oral historian for the uh, for the MDC, and uh, you all have met uh, Becca on one of the earlier lunch and learns. So, so take it away, Wendy. Great. Let me go ahead and uh, start sharing here. All right. Can everyone see my screen? Okay. Yeah, that looks great. Okay, great. All right. So. I wanted to just take a few minutes um, just to, first of all, thank everyone for being here today. And I think Matt covered a lot of my um, background here. I really appreciate that. Um, and I really started diving into this paper, but I, I did want to kind of also add the fact that in the process of going through this beautiful collection and all of these wonderful components, um, I learned so much about the women of the Gilmore family. And it really did sort of um, begin to just kind of build up a bit in that there's far more today than uh, far more than I can share today and it's also kind of asked as many questions as as, as it's answered so it's been a really phenomenal process and it is ongoing research as Matt mentioned that I think is going to inform uh, my master's thesis and so I'm I'm quite excited to share uh, with everyone today so we'll just take a little bit of time to kind of first go through um, a little background for those of you who aren't familiar with the Gilmore Cabin and Farm and then a few kind of pieces of social history as well which I think sort of really bring some light and context to the intersectionality of the women um, in the Gilmore uh, family and how we sort of imagine and understand their creative contributions. And um, and then I'll talk a little bit about nerdy textile stuff and, um, and then also some of hopefully um, some of the direction we, I hope to go in the future. So um, Going in here on the Gilmore Cabin and Farm, um, the cabin itself, it's the post-emancipation home place of the Gilmore family on a tract that it's now a part of Montpelier, um, that at the time that the cabin was constructed, it was related to Dr. James Madison. Um, and the Gilmores, George and Polly Gilmore, were the primary occupants of the cabin and about 16 acres of um, land hey, surrounding that. Yes. Oh, you're, if you could switch the presenter screen. Yeah, yeah. there we go. Nice. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, about 16 acres of land around that was a combination of pasture and woodlot and orchards. And the little cabin is here. So probably many of you have seen it just right across Route 20, um, not very far from the entrance, just about, I think about 50 yards from the entrance of Montpelier. And in 2005, that was open to the public. And um, some of you have likely also seen this road sign that was, I believe, put up in 2009 that discusses the Gilmore's contributions. Um, it is our understanding that George Gilmore was born into slavery at Mont Montpelier around 1810. Family accounts have that somewhere between 1810 and 1813. And um, married Polly Gilmore in about 1850 and began the process of raising a family. The beautiful thing about this cabin, as I'm sure some of you know, is the multi-generational aspect of occupancy. And as you see it restored today, it has a really lovely history um, with Matt himself and Rebecca Coleman Gilmore and the restoration that took place over many, many years um, with this beautiful cabin and restoring it to its uh, pre-1910 um, footprint. And so, in the process of kind of understanding the cabin and looking at how it appeared at one point in time, about circa 1920, you see there was another occupants, um, occupancy area behind the cabin. 
And also, this is how it looked in 1985 and 2000. So she was needing a bit of love. So she's come along um, quite a bit since these days. And this is uh, with the contribution of, of Rebecca Coleman Gilmore having come over and spoken with Matt about the background on the cabin and, and shedding light on this beautiful um, history here. And I think that's really the foundation of the the connection with the descendant community, the MDC focused archaeology. So I really wanted to continue that theme um, throughout engaging on um, on this project. But I think it's also worth noting that this cabin in the back, although the cabin in the front was constructed as we know it today, many of you probably have seen on the signs in 1873, which was pulled from Denver chronology, the occupational structure behind it um, likely was the initial Gilmore residence from 1866 to 1873. And that's that little guy here in the back that you can see and then the outline there. And so that's sort of the context of um, as the family grew and their residency on the land grew. Originally, they had likely settled there in former Confederate officer cabins that had been existing on the property in the 1860s. Uh, we really kind of come into the 1910 era of the cabin, which was when I was quite interested in engaging. And as many of you um, have, have the pleasure of having met and worked with Rebecca Coleman Gilmore, she was a primary source um, and, and connection throughout this process for me and just a tremendous asset in understanding the contributions of these women. Uh, when we get into the methodology, um, we do have a 2002 um, archaeological report and a 2005 as well, but we really kind of wanted to dive into understanding that second floor context, and so I want to take a moment to look into that. Also, some of the material culture that we'll talk about today was also recovered from some of the units behind the cabin in the original occupancy. And hopefully there'll be a little bit of time at the end that I can touch base on that. It, it may come down to the fact that there's far more than can be covered today. And if anyone wants to nerd out on more textile information, we can talk about doing a specific um, presentation to those factors. So um, this is kind of from the architectural report. You can see this is our first floor um, fireplace as it uh, was at the time of restoration. And this is the second floor. As you can see, it was enclosed. The thimble of this second floor hearth did bear some resemblance to other DuPont era thimbles um, when this was enclosed and converted to a wood stove heating methodology. But um, not wanting to make assumptions about really fully understanding the context, we wanted to evaluate this closed context here, especially when I started finding some pretty fascinating little, little components in there. So after opening up the second floor heartland, participating in some excavations there, uh, we came across a whole series of really fascinating material culture. Now, it's worth mentioning that Polly Gilmore's daughter-in-law, um, as I mentioned, there's a multi-generational aspect here. Bertha, her maiden name was Tinsley, married their son, William Gilmore. They continued to raise their family in this cabin. And that has a direct impact on the material culture that is gathered. Not only do we have the oral history from the family that um, Bertha Tinsley was a seamstress, we also have it that Polly was a seamstress. And so that was absolutely reflected and reinforced, um, as many of you may have seen in some of the displays around the lab in Montpelier by some of the sewing and very heavy occupational um, material culture that was found, pins and buttons, etc. cetera. The, um, other kind of fascinating component, which is originally, honestly, where I thought I was going to focus a lot of my, my research was on the, the beads that were found. There were over 2,500 beads found in the cabin around the hearth, which was really fascinating. Um, and I think most of them kind of bore this Edwardian fashion-oriented um, clear context, but there were quite a few. And then also, this is where I got quite excited, is these little tiny scraps of fabric. This was the largest of the pieces of fabric um, that were actually found at the cabin. And I know from my background in, in textile science that there's a tremendous amount of information that can be obtained from just a very, very small fiber sample. Um, however, a lot of the traditional methods for testing that, which are quite destructive, obviously we wanted to avoid. The other fun component that I think um, really lent itself to a lot of the interpretation 
is this little piece of um, busking and corsetry busking. And this is something that stands out to me as a really critical um, understanding of, of the complexity of the work that was being done by these women. And that really started to frame the interpretation of, of what exactly does it take to make a corset, to make gowns, and how are we sort of addressing and viewing the contributions of women? Is it through a set of sort of the androcentric um, historic perspective and thinking of them as sewing, or is it looking at them as artists for the contributions that they deserve? So I wanna take a, a moment or two to talk a little bit about sewing machines um, and sewing in the social history um, that we would have been looking at here. So we do know from 1894 um, tax records that the um, Gilmore family did own in their personal property tax records a sewing machine. And it's worth noting that only 8% of the households in Orange County um, owned a sewing machine of black households at that time. And really, when you're sort of understanding how you can see kind of in this image, how a lot of sewing takes place, it is oftentimes in, in sort of sewing circles and around hearths and around areas for warmth, which makes perfect sense when it comes to the beading. But the, the sort of context that we sometimes miss is that hand sewing actually retained a phenomenal amount of use. This isn't something that was rapidly replaced by domestic sewing machines. And it really was treated as a form of artistry. So this is a great quote from the Ladies Home Journal in 1913, that no machine sewing should be visible on the fine fabrics of party dresses. Machine sewing was typically reserved for the interior of gowns. It was considered to be perhaps a bit gauche. And that's such a, a prevalent dynamic. You can actually sort of witness this in a study done by Virginia Polytechnic Institute in 97. They had over 200 gowns from um, both the uh, several museums in DC, the Smithsonian, the Valentine, et cetera. And they actually went through and surveyed based upon the the, the design of the gowns and understanding their context, whether you were seeing um, hand sewing or just machine sewing. And as you can see, there's a very clear pattern of hand sewing sort of being on the decline as sewing machines improved in technology, um, but it doesn't entirely go away. And we do see machine sewing sort of growing. It's typically done uh, for more traditional work rather than the fancy work of dressmaking. That continues today in the French ateliers, in all couture sewing, hand sewing is the, up until 2006, was the only construction form used in the ateliers. Now you'll see in this picture, there's a few machines and there are far more women sitting at the hand sewing than they are at the machines. So it's of import to note that this wasn't for lack of technology that um, Polly and Bertha Gilmore were likely utilizing um, hand sewing. It's because it is artistry and that tradition of artistry continues today. Now, I want to also discuss a little bit um, the idea of pattern making and dress making, how that differs from just being a seamstress per se, and how that should impact our understanding of these contributions of the family as well. Um, pattern making is a skill, is a highly sophisticated form of um, really engineering, and uh, it, it had to be taught. It's not something that could just sort of be picked up along the way. Um, and it's something that, that takes really years to perfect. And, and you can sort of see from some of these images, these are from the Hampton, Hampton Institute for Ladies. It was typically taught within a um, domestic science context. However, uh, it's a very sophisticated form of, of dressmaking. And I can't stress this enough. And this is something I really did not fully understand when I, even being a person who sewed and had a background in sewing, the level of sophistication in making alterations and designing gowns. Um, on the left there, you'll see a McDowell garment drafting machine from 1886. There's a reason why women's wear was 50 years behind men's wear when it came to being able to make things that were ready to wear and off the shelf. You really had to simplify the design. It wasn't until the 1920s that women's wear started taking off as ready to wear right off the rack. Menswear had been doing that for 
decades prior. Women's wear is much more sophisticated. Their bodies and the way that they size up and down is much more sophisticated. And in fact, that you might have these are these are highly desirable. These these um, sort of the sort of contraption machine you see here for pattern drafting, these are still selling for hundreds of dollars of eBay, and and pattern makers still utilize them today. Um, it is a it's a complicated um, way of drafting. You can draft either flat on a table, as you sort of see um, a woman cutting out a pattern here, but you can kind of see the flat pattern making in the back of these images where alterations are made in a two-dimensional world, or a traditional form is also called draping where it's done on the dress form. That may be what some people are more familiar with. However, at some point it has to come off the dress form and black back to flat pattern making. And that's a, a really sophisticated process. So when we look at what a sort of contemporary garment workflow looks like, um, you sort of have a design, a sketch, a pattern is drafted, and then you kind of create a mock-up in a, uh, a toile. Um, sometimes you'll hear it heard as muslin. It's a plain fabric that's low cost. You sew it and you fit it on the client and or to the fit model. And then you go back and make all the changes for the things you need to do. Personally, in this process, while making very sophisticated garments, I have gone through this cycle as many as 16, 17 times. So that is, these are 16 of an inch in changes um, in before you're ever ready to prepare a sample. So when you think about a paper pattern, which also didn't exist until kind of the second half, the latter half of the of the 19th century. Um, they were pretty rudimentary at first. So there's a phenomenal amount of anatomical and engineering knowledge that goes into this process. Then you get into the, the checking the pattern, sewing it and putting it together. So when you think about what a seamstress in this scenario would do when we use that term, that's really a contemporary sample sewer um, or maybe someone who does alterations like you see in the back of a dry cleaner. This is night and day from understanding um, the entire process. So when we think about what a dressmaker in this era would have done, they would have been doing concepting all the way through the pattern, through the toile and sewing. Many designers now, they don't sew, which I know that may seem surprising when you think about someone doing fashion design, but it's a very different skill set and as is pattern making. So these are really three different roles in a contemporary workflow, unless you have someone doing couture, costume makers are kind of known for doing all three things. But for the most part, when we talk about seamstresses today, we're thinking of the people doing the sewing and we're forgetting about the design and the pattern making. So I prefer to use the term dressmaker because I think in our contemporary understanding, we really need to elevate the understanding of the contributions um, to this process and the cycle, the amount of education. So if any of you had the pleasure of having a grandmother or a great grandmother who sewed or actually did pattern drafting, hopefully you can see a bit now of how much knowledge goes into that process. And uh, this is one of my favorite designers. Um, this He's kind of come across, he inspired the new look Dior gave him contribution for this. And this is from a from a Metropolitan Museum of Art exhibit in 2014. And in order to understand how his garments had been constructed from a pattern making standpoint, they had to do three dimensional scans. In some cases, there's over 50 layers of tool, interior weights. I mean, this is absolutely sort of an engineering masterpiece. Uh, if you look at just the, the number, the volume of tool in his garments. So when you think about what's inside of these beautiful garments, at one point, Charles James spent three years and $20,000 drafting a single sleeve pattern. So this is, this is a very precise sort of art. And now when we look at the contributions of black dressmakers and designers from this era, probably the better known is Elizabeth Hobbs Keckley, you can see these are no less sophisticated in terms of their structure and design. If anything, they're arguably more sophisticated than 
anything that would be in the mid-century, let alone in today's marketplace. Phenomenal amounts of effort, hundreds of hours going into drafting and creating these gorgeous gowns. Elizabeth Hobbs Keckley, who was from Dinwiddie County, actually was born enslaved and has written a beautiful book and was the primary dressmaker for Mary Todd Lincoln. And absolutely worth looking into her stunning work, who's finally sort of now coming into her own and her understanding as a designer. So I wanted to sort of set that foundation so that as, as we look at something as small as a little textile, it tells a tremendous story about the women therein. And also there's a fascinating connection with the DuPonts. Um, they essentially, if you look at this as sort of a list of all of their major contributions that comprised, I think 50% of their primary um, uh, manufacturing processes between 1920 and 1950. All of these um, had a lot of connections to the actual synthetic textile world. And even though not all of them were invented by the DuPonts, these were significant contributions in terms of the process, the viscose rayon process they had to alter so that there weren't fires every time they did that. The DuPonts were very good with chemicals. So it's it's sort of a fascinating understanding to kind of look at uh, things like acetate and particularly nylon, which was 100% their um, synthetic fiber and revolutionized the, the world of textiles, that this was happening right here. In fact, they opened two manufacturing facilities within 60 miles of Montpelier um, in 1929, a viscose rayon plant and their newly developed and perfected acetate rayon um, that they had begun manufacturing in 1924 was when it really hit the marketplace. You can see there's a very tight window. Um, although the um, they opened that plant in 1929, I am sort of interested to understand how there may have been influence and quite close to Montpelier as, as, um, as the DuPonts were obviously quite well connected there. So we had a very strong, this is the textile belt even here in this portion of Virginia. So in understanding the textile testing itself, um, I should note that most of the time when these things are found in context, and that includes when it's up against metal, which is another, another way even in the soil that we still see a significant amount of preservation, um, you tend to have little fibers that get shed into the bottom of the bag, if you will, um, when from when it's collected just from the time that it moves from the field into um, the lab. As we all know, textiles are quite are quite fragile. However, that gives a fantastic opportunity for doing a little bit of testing. And there's a few ways that we could do that. This is sort of the gold standard when you look at that fiber um, itself, an individual strand under scanning electron microscopy. You can see how different they all look. And I want to draw your attention to the fiber on the right, which is polyester. And that's extruded in a mechanical synthetic process, like a lot of the fibers that the DuPonts innovated. So you can see it's very clear, often even under about 200x, um, what type of fiber you're, you're dealing with. So that's what I'm looking for. The other way that we do that is by creating a cross-section. And that was um, entertaining. I um, at some points did that um, melting pipettes on the coffee maker in the lab, which was actually a technique that was <laughs> learned from forensic science. Um, so it actually, there's there are some creative ways to do this on a low budget. Don't get any ideas about this being an incredibly expensive product. Process. We don't have to do scanning electron microscopy to see what you have. Um, you do, however, have to uh, spend a lot of time staring and trying to cut tiny cross section slices of a single um, fiber of textiles. And I think at this point, this is when Matt and Mary began questioning and Chris began questioning my sanity. Um, you also can do some solubility testing and all of this information can be gleaned from the American Association of Textile Chemists. And um, I uh, did my best to concern my clinical chemist father by playing with a few of these um, in, in the house and lab here. But the thing that really popped out, um, there's also melting points, burn tests, but a lot of these are obviously quite destructive, but that's how this is used typically in, in the industry today. But again, there's still quite a lot to be gleaned from just that little individual fiber. And after doing this testing, I found that I actually had five different fabrics of 
four different substrates or fibers themselves. And I delineate obviously between the piece of fabric and what the fiber itself is made from. They, they each have different weaves and how they're constructed as a fabric um, and how that comes out, whether it's taffeta or whether that's a poplin, but the fiber itself is what told a tremendous story in the circumstances. Note that the weave, those can tell stories as well. Um, the print, the imagery, the dye methodology, there's a phenomenal amount of technology that's emerging for diagnostic criteria around this. But for um, here, its purposes here, this was a fascinating and fairly direct analysis that in this circumstance, as soon as I looked at this under a microscope, I could see that I had acetate. Um, actually, I knew I had a synthetic at this point. It wasn't until I actually got to uh, the section, the cross section, that I started to be able to see this very distinct striation that we find in acetate. So that's at 500x. Um, if any of you are professionals at making cross-section slides, please don't laugh at my cross-section slides. Um, <laughs> I did my best and they did their job, but they're not as pretty as what you would get with expensive equipment. Um, and the second one was rayon, um, which I found several types of rayon in, in varying weaves in this little strip of tiny, tiny piece of seam binding there. And again, as soon as you pop it under the microscope, you can see how clean those lines are. That tells me that this was extruded through um, basically a, a tiny, tiny spaghetti strainer where the, the, the actual substrate is sort of squeezed through like you did with Play-Doh when you were a kid and it made a um, beautiful synthetic textile. So these are my cross sections from um, the rayon itself. And so by kind of cross-examining and understanding both the solubility test, which is what kind of confirmed for me that this was acetate and rayon was cross-referencing against those, just take a little tiny piece of, of broken fiber and drop that in acetone or hydrochloric acid, and you can tell whether it goes away in five minutes or whether it stays. So that gave the, the answer. What's fascinating about that is if you remember from my prior slide of the DuPonts, um, acetate wasn't invented until 1924, and it wasn't really hitting the mainstream in terms of manufacture with the DuPonts until 1929. So that gave the confirmation that the second floor hearth could not have been enclosed in 1910 when they did the original modifications to the home, but rather in 1935. So that was a, a nice little neat bow to tie on a, a, a closed context. Um, in the last minute or two here before I open up for questions, I want to talk a little bit about some of what I hope to be my future research. Um, I have a, a hope, uh, we'll call it a hope, but the units in red here, that's kind of an aerial shot of the, of the Gilmore cabin and the area where we did excavations in 2005. Um, those little red units are where we found corsetry busking. And Corsetry is incredibly difficult to construct, going back to that pattern making discussion. This was invented in the mid 19th century to allow you to open and close your corsets without having to relace them. And it's typically mounted on like three quarter inch steel boning, serious stuff. And um, through looking at those um, two part busk, it's a definitely a two part busk. Um, those particular individual units were all different weight and different sizes and different brands. So at this point, even without doing any further analysis, which I hope to do, I believe we have a, a minimum number of individual units, three different corsets. Um, and that's exciting because it tells me that this isn't a quick alteration so that you sort of understand um, the complexity. The second slide shows how corsets are typically altered. You might add a little panel, but these things are three layers and incredibly precise, incredibly difficult to make and manufacture. And so you're not going to have the boning or the busking, which is this front part being taken out likely unless you're doing massive modifications or probably more accurately, making it from scratch. And so my hypothesis is that the Gilmore women are actually making these corsets on site, which is why we have different pieces of what would be this busking found in possibly the building behind, which may well be a studio or a workplace of some sort. So 
that's one of the, that's a little teaser of what I hope to come. Um, there are so many questions um, that, that have come out of this. I really would love to go back through the material culture um, and all of the boxes from those excavation units and see if there's anything that jumps out at to me um, as I've gained a better understanding of, of the sort of pre-Victorian material culture for um, domestic dressmaking. And also hopefully re-examine the beads and do a bit of interpretation on that. Um, so I'll also note five generations after Polly Gilmore, we have Gilmore women showing up in the census as dressmakers, as professional dressmakers in Pennsylvania, and one living in the fashion district in New York. So to me, there's a very clear connection. This also connects to what's happening at Montpelier. We've gotten some fascinating information about um, there being a sort of organic fashion community around uh, Lillian Page in the Page House. And she was actually also connected to those Gilmore descendants. Um, there's a tremendous amount of resources in the Holsinger collection. It's a photographic collection at UVA. There were 700 images of, um, of the formerly enslaved, the young, the designers of the era all around the Charlottesville area. There are Scots, carpenters, and tailors in those photos that I would love to identify and try to um, examine and understand personal identity and dress and how it impacted um, the women of the space. So it's all part of the kind of high level approach of better understanding how dress is a reflection of um, the voice of, of this community in the power of place and how much of it was happening here and elevating their contributions to something well beyond sewing. But um, if you think about Charles James and looking at those images from the Met, I don't think anyone's calling Charles James a, uh, a seamstress. So it's, um, I think we want to elevate the way that we understand what our grandmothers and great grandmothers and their predecessors did. And it's been a tremendous honor to um, work with the descendants and, and hold these objects in my hand as someone who has a tremendous amount of respect for the artistry that went into it and see what stories can be teased out of it. So I want to take um, some minutes now and just open it up for questions and um, see if anyone has any um, stories they'd like to tell, information even. I know we have so many wonderful people on this call today, so I'd love to open it up for questions and, and see what, uh, what everyone would like to know. Wow, thank you, Wendy. That presentation was absolutely so rich and uh, inspiring that that it what it really shows and what, what we'll do is if you have questions you can either put them into the uh, to the chat or you can raise your hand and um and uh ask some uh questions um but wendy it really shows you know the level of sophistication you're 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 discovering has only been revealed by because of the level of sophisticated knowledge you have of this incredibly complex material culture. So really want to thank you for that. Um, you. And there's um, a couple of questions that's popped up. Crystal, hi, Crystal from Monticello. Hi, uh, Crystal. One of our current parts, you know, Wendy very well. <laughs> says, what, Crystal says, hi, Wendy, thanks for your presentation. Two questions. Um, were there any buttons found during excavations? And uh, does uh, does the oral history uh, talk about these these women's efforts? Um, we do. Those are two fantastic questions. There have been buttons um, found as well. Um, and that's something that I would love to do a bit more analysis on. And for any archaeologists on the call, let me take a moment to plug the fact that you could still find little baby scraps of textiles around the shanks of your buttons. So be gentle when you grab them in the field, um, because there may well, just like with leather, you get a differential rate of preservation ar around, um, around metal and close to them. Um, and so buttons are also something that I hope to spend a little more time doing analysis on, um, there are hundreds of, of types of buttons. I mean, there's a nerdy niche for every category. Um, I really focused on the textiles in this 
circumstance, but I believe that all of these stories are going to weave together to tell more. I should also note that buttons themselves were not on women's wear until post-1850, and so you still had a lot of hook and eye, and that is reflected in material culture. It's a lot of questions I have around safety pins, for example, whether that's a differential discard pattern um, or whether that's actually a difference in use. They tend to be sold in multi-packs in this era. So I've spent a little time in the archives looking at the supply company records, hoping I could tease more out of that. Um, so it's, as you can see, um, Crystal was was helpful in some of the early conversations around evaluating this as well. Um, this this definitely has legs in terms of, of level analysis, and it kind of went beyond a, an individual and early Mac paper, and um, to the oral history as well. Absolutely, there's been discussions in all branches of the family about there being dress making occurring here. Um, but it has really just been mind boggling to see that material culture just fall square and, and actually enhance that. And then to be able to come back and say, not only were you right, but you were so right. And they're also using these incredibly innovative materials like rayon very early in their material um, culture cycle, which I should say the, the United Silk Organization didn't even bother to create a counter movement against rayon until 1935. So we know that the Gilmores had left the cabin because of um, some changes in, in and, and a bit of a, a darker story at the tail end of their family occupation and them losing the property. And, um, but we know they were likely left by 1935. And so the fact that they were utilizing these materials long before there was even an industrial response is reflective to me of their level of innovation and contributions as well. Carolyn, you have your, your hand up. You have a question. Yes, early on you said that the fabric, that half inch uh, piece of fabric was found in the upstairs hearth. And I was wondering whether you uh, think that most of the sewing was done uh, at some time upstairs? Uh, <laughs> that's, that's a great question. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. That's a fantastic question. Um, is that is Was there anything else or was that the primary? I was thinking of something else. I forgot it. <laughs> okay, well, chime in and, and let me know. Um, I do. I think that the, as a person who sews myself, and I think many of us who do, we know that the handwork can tend to be time consuming. I would not want to be laying out patterns and cutting fabric in a space where my dogs and children and the very busy household of the Gilmores were. At this point, it was a two-story cabin with multiple rooms and an addition that we no longer see reflected. And there were gads of toddlers in the building around the turn of the century. And so we, um, I, I expect based upon my own, uh, I have Scotty dogs who like to just come and lay squarely on anything that I'm trying to do that, you know, when you're doing the kind of delicate handwork that is done in finishing, oftentimes it really can only be done by hand. Also because the technology of sewing machines at the era was still a little rough. So you didn't want it to show on the outside of the dress and you also wanted to. So I think they were doing most of their hand sewing by the hearth and by for the light and the warmth and the ambiance. And I'm suspicious that the pattern making itself, which is big flat tables is usually the most efficient way, may have been happening in that former cabin behind the cabin that was demolished around in the 1930s after the DuPont acquisition of the property. Yeah. I, I I so also um, um, was wondering who they made dresses for. That's an excellent question. I am so hoping that at some point I have family or oral history in the community who can come forward and say, by the way, I mean, the ultimate dream is to have someone say, this was made by Bertha, because I believe that those garments probably made their way into many of the households of Orange County. The level of ornamentation for 2,500 beads 
that's not a gown that you sort of wear to the post office. <laughs> that's going to be something that's going to be quite elaborate and quite expensive to make with hours of handwork associated. I made I made a garment once that had over 300 hours in it and quite a bit of handwork as well. So um, that's that's the vision I have. I would love to see that play out in material culture because I do believe they probably had a client base that they were working with. Well, Wendy, we have so many questions popping in the chat. I'm going to try to focus them on some okay. of the things that Carolyn had asked about. Um, Hillary, uh, hi, Hillary, uh, asks, Hello. uh, this was fascinating. Could you talk more about the Gilmore descendants who are professional dressmakers? Yes, I'm still hoping to get in direct contact. I've been working with, um, with the descendant community here. I, I feel like it's obviously best for them not only to run point, but also it's their family. So I, it, we're, we're sort of letting them take the lead on, on reconnecting. But um, the census records, which as everyone I hope on this call knows are not always very accurate. So if they took the time to call out a profession, especially for a woman of color, it's because that's what they did and they were known for. It doesn't mean that they didn't do this as a profession. It just wasn't reflected by the enumerator for variety of racist reasons, but it does mean that if they took the time to say she was a dressmaker, she was a dressmaker. So um, there are there are two two of Bertha's granddaughters and their daughters, um, one in Coatesville, PA, and one in Staten Island, um, who is working around the New York area in the in the fashion district. And Raquel has a question. Hi, Raquel. Uh, Hi, Raquel. Raquel did the uh, the field school this year and is and is back at home. Uh, Raquel says, "Thanks so much, Wendy. That was in so informative." What kind of further questions come up after the fiber analysis, and what can be interpreted based on the kind of fabrics that the Gilmores choose chose to use and buy? Yeah, these are both really great questions. I think that um, for me, a lot of it is going to come into, I would like to go back to the space and the place and, and see what more I can find in the bulk of the material culture that was excavated, because there is thousands of artifacts that were found um, and go back through with this in mind and sort of better understand where this may have been occurring on the homestead and in the farm. And also, um, try to connect it and understand where there may have been an educational component in the community, um, who was teaching. There's a lot of, of sort of knowledge and transfer that I think I'm hoping um, Becca is gonna be tremendously instrumental on um, working with the MDC and, and gathering their stories. And I really want that to inform the questions that are coming and make sure that the questions that I'm asking are, are the MDC's questions and not just my own uh, nerdy textile brain. <laughs> but I think there are, tremendously, to the second question, tremendously innovative materials being utilized here. Um, so that's that's a very fascinating question for me and one that I would like to spend a little more time in the Hagley understanding um, when these things first went to market specifically in this county. And Vicki has a uh, question related to this and then we'll get to the bead question. Um, first, hi Vicki, uh, great to have you here. Uh, Vicki says, fabulous presentation, thanks so much. What's the oldest piece of fabric that you have been able to identify um, in the deposits in the cabin? In the deposits in the cabin, there were um, some cotton pieces of fabric that could well have been significantly older. Um, and so, I'm I'm quite fascinated in and there's also jute which is um, which is a really it's, it's very difficult to identify without more expensive methodologies um, the actual time frame but there's a lot of great work being done in dye sublimation um, understanding laser ablation for that dye sublimation understand what types of dyes are being utilized I may be able to refine it a little bit farther but with the cotton and the jute that could well have been made significantly earlier. So looking at the early part of the cabin history as being 1873, it could be all the way back to 1873. It's tough to know, but I hope to. And uh, Ann Roper, hi Ann, uh, asks, please speak about the beads that were found. This is one of my favorites. Please speak oh. about the beads that were found, description and origins and how they were used. And I know you have yes. a lot of background on this as well, Wendy, which has been so much fun. 
Yes, I actually grew up, um, my mother taught me beadwork. Uh, she was taught by her close friends of the White Mountain Apache. And so I, I was delighted and excited when I connected with, uh, with the beads. And many of the beads are the sort of hex cut um, apparel. There are a pretty wide variety of beads. And so much like the pins, I need to better understand their distribution and manufacturing in the area in order to better understand how it could be dated. But I would say the bulk, probably 90% of the beads were these sort of hex cut, shiny. And those were added um, not just for the visual effect on of sparkly, um, but also to give weight and drape to a garment. And so you would line the edge of the garment and that would give it this beautiful hang and drape. And so it's, it's important to know that beadwork kind of accomplished a lot of different um, goals in, in, a, in an artist's design. So to me, the beadwork is very much the artistry and it probably has a more um, Edwardian turn of the century as late as Edwardian emphasis, although they certainly did beading clear into the 1920s. And I remember with the analysis that um, uh, Lori Burgess did there, yes. she suggested evidence of Bead bead working for uh, purse uh, potentially purses and then also um, for uh, you know decorative items like for shawls. Yes. Is that is that what you saw as well? Yes, the the capelets in particular almost always had a line of beads around them. But if you think of the sort of even like Titanic era visual images of of these long sort of draping flowing dresses of the sort of later 19th century coming into the Victorian period, it's very common to have that weight on those garments. And in particular, those sort of black purplish hex beads um, that are faceted and, and very shiny. Um, and there are a few more traditional seed beads um, that I would love to kind of spend a little bit more. I, I did spend some time looking through and there's been some tremendous analysis done, but the bulk of the collection was really around the hex beads and, and I believe was utilized for ornamentation. Could also have been utilized even for the beadwork done on these gorgeous lampshades as well. Um, so there's, there's a lot of potential uses and applications, but most of them were the standard size 10 hex black um, that were used quite frequently in apparel and ornamentation and accessories. And one thing I want to add with that, Wendy, is that Please. none of this would have been possible without the collaboration that we have and had for many, many years with the architectural department. Because when the um, the uh, architectural investigatory team went in to open up the hearth, they actually found the deposit of ash that was in the um, in the second floor hearth, sealed inside that that brick enclosure inside the stone hearth, and we were doing excavations at the uh, um, at the uh, Civil War encampments about it just in the woods, and I remember um, uh, Maggie running out and saying, "Matt, Matt, we you know we found this layer of ash inside the hearth. You got to come out and see it." And so Thank we you, went. Maggie. And they, <laughs> they had not touched any of it, which is great. They could have wow. easily just cleared it out. And so we um, put this all into our, you know, our sandbags for water screening. And boy, when we started water screening that and finding the thousands of beads, you know, it, what we didn't know at the time is there was all the fabric that there was in there as well. And so this speaks to, you know, having, you know, having this collaboration between departments is so important. And yes. It's been really a hallmark of what Montpelier is, everything. And you know, that's why it's so great to have Hillary here. And, and uh, you know, everybody knows what she, what each other is doing. And we can, they, we can point each other to new uh, directions, which is, um, which is wonderful. Um, one thing, uh, we're recording this and I'll send the recording out to all the participants because there's a number of folks that, weren't able to attend today, but it did register and feel free to share this. We'll have it on YouTube. Also, Wendy, is there a paper that you've done that you'd be willing to share um, on this or maybe in the future we could do this? Um, and, and also I'll share the Lori Burgess report and some of the archeological reports Thanks. in the email I'll send out. But do you have anything you'd be willing to throw in with this or? Yeah. Um, 
I think I, I want to make a few tweaks on the paper that I presented it back um, before I would distribute, but that wouldn't take very long. So I think probably um, in in a week or two I could I could have something that we could look to distribute. So um, and that it really focuses more on the textiles themselves. So apologies, it's a little nerdy, um, but it, it's a solid um, it's a solid understanding and. And if there are more questions about fabric ID, um, fiber ID, and kind of the specifics of that process, I would be happy to kind of revisit that in a, in a specific session around that as well. And Wendy, uh, Carolyn was asking, what are the size of those, um, those faceted uh, beads? Um, they are size 11s, I believe. Um, I have to pull my report to know for certain, but they're kind of what you would expect for a typical seed bead today. They haven't changed too much. And that's what we found in sort of uh, copious amounts. <laughs> yeah, you'd say about an eighth of an inch? Um, actually a little smaller, probably about a 16th. Yeah. Yeah, they we yeah them in the window screen, but the, anything bigger, they would have gone right through when, when we were doing the water <laughs> screen. Yeah, that's for um, props to having detailed archaeology and archaeology and field people. Thank you. <laughs> well, great. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for doing this and sharing your research. This has been just, you know, and this this is also speaks to the importance of collections. I mean, for you, so you all know these excavations at the Gilmore Cabin happened uh, over 20 years ago, that these excavations happened in 2002. And to have, um, you know, the collections where, you know, they're kept safely stored, you know, outside of, you know, first they're stored in terms of having their provenience be protected. Also making sure, you know, Bill doing, Bill, um, Bichelle doing due diligence, making sure that we don't have infestations of mice, which happen in a rural location, as anybody here in Montpelier can tell you, <laughs> um, is incredibly important. Um, so uh, it, it's a, a lot of components to this, not just the excavations, but the curatorial uh, work that goes into the archaeology. And then being lucky enough to network and have someone like you, Wendy, come and, and an be interested and have your, share your knowledge with us on these collections. So uh, thank you so much. And I will yeah. um, include Wendy's email in uh, the recording. So if you all have any questions, you is that all right to do that, Wendy? Please, please do. And stories, questions, share it all. I love it. So, and it's it's been so wonderful seeing so many friends here in this presentation. Again, if you just tuned in, I will, um, I'm going to send this recording out as soon as it downloads. It'll probably be later tonight by the time I get it loaded up to uh, to YouTube. So, but, um, so, well, uh, anyone have any other, any other questions? Um, I'm going to look through the, the chat here. Um, Oh, Prinny. Hello, Prinny. Uh, Prinny Anderson uh, says, reminds me of both grandmothers born in the 19th century who talked about fine dresses only being made by hand in the 1950s. Um, yes. Uh, and uh, Clint, hello, Clint. Clint says, a hugely impressive presentation bringing the Gilmore Cabin alive. Thanks to all, especially Miss Ray, who made this possible. Um, and uh, Jane <laughs> could listen to Wendy for days. Wonderful presentation. Uh, so many comments. I'll I'll share these comments with you as well, Wendy. Uh, Thank so. you so much. I really appreciate everyone's time and and for coming to hear these stories today. And I would welcome feedback and any additional input and just your own stories too. It, it's it's that confirmation that these are stories that need to be told. So I very much appreciate it. And thank you, Matt, um, so much for allowing me to present today and all your support and tremendous amount of encouragement of everyone on the call and at the Montpelier staff. And if you want to meet Wendy, we have, Wendy's going to be working with us on the expeditions through the fall and the spring. So uh, mm -hmm. sign up for an expedition and You'll be able to pick Wendy's brain for hours in the uh, in the unit, so and, and also in the lab. With joy. So. All right. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in today. Great to see you all, and uh, hope to see you at at Montpelier very soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much.